What if I was to tell you that a secret war has been going on for billions of years? A war fought simultaneously on a global and a microscopic level. We all came late to this war, and despite what we might like to think, we are in over our heads. My name's Claire Gorry, and I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Melbourne, currently studying some of the smallest organisms on our planet, bacteria. For much of history, bacteria have been responsible for about 50% of all human deaths worldwide. And this includes diseases like tuberculosis or the bubonic plague or Black Death. Bacteria are frequently opportunists, meaning that they wait until we are vulnerable to attack and cause disease or infection. For example, a hundred years ago, the Spanish influenza virus swept across the world in a devastating pandemic, leaving tens of millions dead in its wake. It's said to have killed the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time. But actually, many of these deaths were caused by bacterial pneumonia that attacked a population made vulnerable by the influenza virus. Despite cases like this, for much of history, bacteria have been held in a sort of balance by naturally occurring antibiotics. But the discovery of penicillin in 1928 and its subsequent clinical use disturbed this balance and changed the tide of the war. We had a new magic bullet in our fight against bacterial infections. Problems that were once potentially fatal were now just minor inconveniences. Antibiotics are designed to fit into a certain part of the bacterial cell, much like a key is designed to fit into a lock. When a bacterial cell encounters an antibiotic, it's got really two options. One, it dies. The second option is that it evolves, it mutates, it survives. In evolving, it's essentially changing the shape of the lock so that the antibiotic key can no longer fit and is therefore no longer effective. Our options then are either to alter the key to fit the new shape of the lock, make a new key to fit that same lock, or just target an entirely different lock. The problem that we face is that we have a relatively limited selection of antibiotics, and bacteria are incredibly good at adapting and evolving. Many common bacterial species actually replicate so quickly that one starting cell can become almost 300 trillion cells in just 24 hours. And every single one of those cells has had the chance to mutate and evolve, potentially to become resistant to antibiotics. Due to us using antibiotics so much in recent history, bacteria are encountering them much more frequently and at much higher concentrations than would naturally happen. This has meant that many species now are resistant to not just one or two antibiotics at once, but to many or even all available antibiotics. These highly resistant bacteria are called superbugs, and they're becoming increasingly common. We're seeing a resurgence of dangerous bacterial infections that we thought were a thing of the past. In America, this year, public health officials have found the Yersinia pestis bacteria hiding on the spiny backs of fleas. That is the exact same bacteria that caused the Black Death 700 years ago. In Australia and many other countries, we're seeing untreatable cases of gonorrhea, and a lot of people don't actually get symptoms, so can unwittingly pass this untreatable infection onto others. In the Northern Territory, there's an ongoing case study of a patient who's had the same bacterial infection for 17 years, continually evolving to evade treatment, and with nasty symptoms similar to tuberculosis. New antibiotics are being developed, but we face a conundrum. The more we develop, the more resistant the bacteria eventually become. In fact, it's been estimated that by 2050, antibiotic resistance will have cost us 300 million lives. So we need a new way to deal with these bacteria, a way that focuses on the source of the problem. Currently, if you're in hospital with a bacterial infection, it can potentially take several days before the doctors know what bacteria they're dealing with, whether or not it's resistant to antibiotics, and if it is, whether or not there are still viable antibiotic options for treatment. This is a problem with technology, not with expertise. The doctors are, of course, doing everything they possibly can to help the patients in their care. But unfortunately, current diagnostic methods are just sometimes too slow to help the doctors before the infections progress too far. This actually happened to my friend's dad, along with two other men who were admitted to the same ward in his hospital. All three men developed the same bacterial infection. 
all three were permanently affected by it, but the outcomes were very different. The first man to become infected actually died because every antibiotic they tried failed. The second man was headed down much the same path as the first, but because they knew what had happened to that first man, they acted preemptively and actually amputated his leg just to stop the infection from spreading. My friend's father was comparatively lucky. He survived and he kept all of his limbs. Because he was the third man infected, they had enough time to find a rarer antibiotic that was effective in treating the infection. The problem was that the antibiotic that worked to cure the infection also caused kidney failure. So he was on dialysis for the rest of his life. But what if a relatively fast diagnostic technique could actually determine what bacteria was present and what its likely strengths and weaknesses were, including bacterial resistance? What if we could also predict which individuals were most at risk of these bacterial infections? and maybe even stop the infections from arising in the first place. In my research, I've been focusing on bacteria present in hospitalized patients. And this is crucial because people in hospital are often at their most vulnerable. The bacteria I'm studying, Klebsiella pneumoniae, as with many other species, is incredibly adaptable. It's found living happily in water, soil, plants, and a huge range of animals. A group in China recently sent some of this bacteria to space just to see if it would survive under zero gravity and under increased radiation. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it did, and it thrived. In healthy humans like you and me, Klebsiella can be found living in your gut or your throat, causing no problems. But if an individual is made vulnerable for one reason or another, Klebsiella can cause a range of infections, including urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, and even pneumonia and meningitis. So how is it possible that one species is able to adapt so effectively? Well, the key to understanding bacteria lies in their DNA, which tells the bacterial cell everything it's capable of. And with new genome sequencing technology, we can actually decode that same DNA and predict what the likely strengths and weaknesses of the bacteria are. In my research, I've been looking specifically at bacteria present in individuals when they are first admitted to the hospital. A single rectal swab can tell me what bacteria is present, including not just those actively causing infection, but those that have the potential to do so later on. Now, I know a rectal swab might not sound particularly pleasant, but the results have been really enlightening we found that actually only 12% of infections are contracted in the hospital. The majority of infections we see are actually caused by bacteria that were already living inside the patient when they were admitted. They brought their own bacteria in with them, and then it caused infections. This is a game changer. If we'd known what bacteria were present when my friend's dad was admitted to hospital, he might still be alive today. That information could have helped the treating doctors provide faster and more effective treatment, either to improve the quality of life following infection or maybe to prevent the infections from occurring in the first place. We need to get this sort of technology into hospitals now to help people when they're at their most vulnerable. We could be taking samples from every patient that comes through the door so we know exactly what they're carrying and what they could be at risk from. Some hospitals overseas are already trialling this approach, and they're seeing huge improvements in the number of infections and the fatalities resulting from them. So I'll finish by asking this. Why aren't we doing this yet? And what do we need to do to make sure that we can? Thank you.